met some of you, but there are many here who probably don't know who I am, so if I may just introduce myself. My name is Reverend Kirk Lawton. I serve as chaplain at Ocean Lakes Family Campground out in the Surfside area. We've gathered here this afternoon, as we all certainly are aware, for the purpose of giving a tribute of love and gratitude to God, thanksgiving for the life of Troy Richard Spencer. As we're here to remember Troy, we're here to say to you, his family members, that we do care. Sympathy is a good word. Sometimes it's thrown out casually without much meaning, but somebody describes sympathy as being your pain in our hearts. And we do share that with you today. Because many of us have gone through the valley of the shadow of death, we know what it's like to lose a loved one. And so when we say you have our sympathy, it's more than just a word. But there's a third purpose that brings us together, and that's uh, probably the highest purpose of all. And that's not only to remember Troy, to express sympathy, but to worship God. That's why traditionally we have a minister, such as myself, who would preside at a service like this. God's promised he'll always be with us. We all have different views of God, how he works, who he is. But differences are not important at a time like this. We're here to bind together ties of love for family and for each other. God is here, and because of God's presence, that means this is a sacred place here, right now, sacred time. Certainly not because I'm here, but because God is. And so as we begin this service, let's bow together if we may and just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me, please? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful indeed for the fact that you do love us. We know that you blessed us in many ways, all of us, that you've not shielded us from grief or sorrow or disappointment. When we lose loved ones, oh God, we know that we're forced to rely upon your strength, but we don't have strength. So we ask that you will give us your strong arms to uphold us now in this earth as we express our gratitude for the life of the one whom we honor today. Thank you for hearing us as we offer our prayer. In the matchless name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Yes, Jesus. I'd like to share with you a brief passage from the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, and I'm sure some of you remember some of these phrases in this. It's a popular, uh, well-known passage for many people. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm not going to read the entire part, but uh, just uh, gives us some things about where we are in our life. These are the words of Scripture from the Lord. To everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones. A time to embrace. And a time to refrain from embracing. A time to keep. And a time to lose. A time to tear. And a time to sow. A time to keep silence. And a time to speak. And then in the following verses, Skipping over a few, the author says, I have seen what God-given tasks with which we are to be occupied. God has made everything beautiful in its own time, and he's put in eternity in our hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. I know nothing is better for us than to rejoice, to have good in our lives, so that we eat and drink and enjoy all of good things. They are the gift of God. We're going to be hearing some of the gifts that God has given to us through Troy today. And as we hear these, we're going to reminisce, we're going to reflect. We're going to have several music selections during this service. And the first of these is just a reminder of the fact that God does love us. He is a great God. We don't understand him always. But God
God is good all the time now. The hymn writer wrote it, and you know these words. They'd be sung by Kevin and Loretta, How Great Thou Art.
but uh, several folks are, are, are planning to, to share some words with us. Uh, first Jeff, and then Sean, and then Howard, and then after Howard, if there are several others in the congregation who would like to share a word with us, a tribute, if you want to come to the pulpit here, you may, but you don't have to. I know this microphone intimidates people sometimes. So if you want to, you can just stay right where you are. Maybe if you stand, we can hear you a little better. Doesn't have to be something sad and solemn. Uh, if it's something everybody laughs, which I'm sure Troy would be honored by that. Uh, just a brief uh, word or two. You don't need to speak 30, 45 minutes. Whoever you do, you know. But just to, to share. I'm sure this would be a blessing to have the number just to hear from some of you. Uh, words of tribute, how your life has been enriched by knowing Troy. So first we'll hear from Jeff and then Sean and then Howard, and then I'll get back up and invite anybody in the congregation closing, and we'll have one other one later. Jeff, if you come first, please, sir. <coughs> When Troy called me this week and said, hey, Uncle Jeff, can you, you know, say something to the uh, service? I, uh, I said, I'm going to try, but if I cancel at the very end, don't get mad at me. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I understand. And uh, so I decided this week, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell, I think, a funny story. <laughs> we have everybody out here got many, many, and uh, I talked to his good friends up north and cousin, and every one has said, Do you remember when Troy did this? Do you remember when Troy did that? And, and we just, you know, we ended up laughing, you know, at, at, at the end of the sad phone call, and we're just, you know, just cracking up. and. Uh, my cousin said, there'll never be another, and that's the truth. A lot of people say this, but there's only one hand. And they'll, I mean, they'll never ever be duplicated. And, uh, and so one time, back up at the shop, Troy had many talents. Uh, he was a state caliber wrestler, great water skier. He could actually ski with new skis, bare feet. Uh, he was a great body and paint man, which is an art in its own, and he was a great musician. And it goes without saying, he was a great dad, and a great husband, and a great brother. And so, uh, but his biggest talent was his personality. <laughs> I mean, and he was, he was really that, you know, and he couldn't change it. And so one time, he was running the body shop up in, at our dealership. And our good friend Jerry, who's just like a brother, uh, was working. He said, I'm going on vacation. Troy, can you take my Volkswagen while I'm gone? Troy said, yeah, Jerry, we can handle that. And uh, he said, I'll be out for about a week, you know, and I'm going to come back. And uh, Jerry's a school teacher, but he worked with us during the summer. And uh, he said, all right, that, that's great. He said, well, Troy, you know, gets out the color book and pick out the color you want. So it ended up being like a real nice silver blue. And it was, it was sharp, and uh, so we go ahead and um, about a week goes by, and uh, Jerry comes back in, and Troy says, I have it ready for you Monday when you get back. Uh, so Jerry comes into work uh, Monday morning, and he says, hey Jeff, is my car done? I said, oh yeah. And uh, he said, I can't wait to see it. He said, I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> so we all go over there, summertime, so the doors are open. And all of a sudden, people come out of the detail shop, showroom, and the mechanics all come out. And we gather around the car. Troy had put a tarp cover over the car. All right? So we're all standing around, and Jerry comes up, and he said, you ready, Jerry? He said, yeah. He pulls off the tarp. It's pink. <laughs> Hot pink. <laughs> and Jerry looks at him. And he goes, you, and he just broke down laughing. And Troy was laughing so hard, and we were all, we just fell down laughing. And who does this? Do you know how hard it is to paint a Volkswagen? And there was a lot of effort. And Troy was laughing so hard, we almost had to hold him 
up. You know that big hoggy laugh? And he comes up to him, they gave each other a hug. He said, don't worry, Jerry. He said, I'll put it back the way you want it. Well, actually, he kept it there for quite two, three months. <laughs> and this is the history teacher going to high school, driving his pink Volkswagen every day to work until somebody got it back in the shop. And so, I mean, that was just, I mean, I, I got a million of them. And I, I know we all do. But that was, uh, I, I just wanted to keep this upbeat because he was upbeat. You know, even when the chips were down, that guy never had a bad day. Ever. And and, and the fact that he knew the Lord is the best thing of all. Because when we get up there, I believe we're all going. I can guarantee you, he's going to be there. And if we're going to have a blast, <laughs> I, I promise you that. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Sean Gucci. I was a good friend of Troy's. And Jeff, I really appreciate you crying. Right <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. I thought I was going to make it. I thought about Troy. I said, no, I'm just going to keep this upbeat. And I just uh, kind of folded at the end of So, so be, be my guest. I can worry about you. Uh, yeah. I met Troy about 20 years ago. He was flipping a house and it expired, his listing expired. So I sent him a brochure and uh, I was trying to get his listing. And he called me and said, Hey, according to this brochure, you're the man. You can sell anything. <laughs> and I could tell Troy was different. <laughs> different. And uh, I said, Well, the, the brochure is BS, but I'm not bad. <laughs> so I said, All right, come on out, let's talk. And we ended up doing a lot of business together. Um, he also took me under his wing and taught me how to build property. Now, <laughs> he could set you straight when he messed up. He had no problem breaking some things, let's say. Um, but he was also really good at lifting people up. And I'll never forget the first time he told me, I'm proud of you. Never had anybody say that to me other than my dad. And it was a little odd at first. But I, it got to the point where I was craving it, you know, and said, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of who you are. I'm proud of your accomplishments. I'm proud to call you my friend. <clears throat> There's a lot of stories like Jeff, I'm gonna keep it to one. Um, I did witness Troy handle a kid coming in and tagging the first floor of one of his flips all <laughs> over the floor. And now he handled that and the kid and his dad. Um, <laughs> electricians, if you want to call them this, I believe Troy called these guys Tweedledee and Tweedledee. <laughs> Putting the dining room chandelier in the two-story entry hall at the okay, and the chandelier for the entry hall in the dining room. <laughs> he had a custom shower he was really, really proud of. He turned that on to show it to me, and the water promptly ran away from the drain. <laughs> he dealt with contractors, zoning people, code people, sellers and buyers going AWOL. Um, and you guys might not know this, uh, I believe it was second place we came in. We got the opportunity 
to try to be the new host for a cooking series on it. <laughs> Somebody has seen the CD. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he opened that with the guitar lick that would probably <laughs> melt your eyeballs. <laughs> um, but it was amazing. We heard back and said, oh, we're going to use this other guy. But <clears throat> we were happy to come in second place. Uh, Troy handled all of a lot of grace and classic Troy directness, meaning quite a bit of colorful language. <laughs> um, but the story I want to share today took a year. It was a year in the making. Some of you guys know about this. Late 2006, early 2007, we heard about a lake called Lake Water in South Carolina. So we drove down to find property to flip because we couldn't find anything in North Carolina that was reasonable. So we had to go take a trip. Plus, Troy loved to take trips. <laughs> so we, we found a waterfront marina. It was a marina, combination marina, gas station. Uh, it had 17 boat slips, and it was a convenience store, too. It's all this right on the waterfront, gorgeous view. Uh, and I told Troy, hey, it is rare to find anything with 17 slips. That's amazing, 17 boat slips. And the fact that it's zoned for gas means we can cover <coughs> whatever the heck we want. So he got really excited and we went down to the zoning department in Fairfield County, South Carolina. The zoning department was about half of a mobile home in the parking lot of the courthouse. <laughs> one guy, one guy in here. And the guy said, hey look, um, that lot when we'll allow condos on that, it allows for condos. However, the septic is overloaded and the nearest, the nearest sewer is two miles away. Okay. He also told us it's just above the water line. In Lake Watery, they had a spillover dam, which means the water could go up 15 feet at a time. So most of the houses on the waterfront were on stilts. So this place was barely above where it needed to be. Had no, the septic was shot, the sewer was two, two miles away. Um, and he said, look, the local HOA, the Homeowners Association, is gonna shoot this down. So we got back in the car. And I figured we're going to drive around and look at other lots and other houses. And Troy Crumpy drives us back to the marina. Goes in, gets the number of the owners from the cashier, and sets up an appointment with the people. I'm thinking, man, okay. I said, hey, Troy, let's not chase this again. Barely above the water line, no septic system, the sewer is two miles away. It's probably worth two and a half million as it stands. And they probably went 100 grand down. Um, the HOA is going to fight it, and they probably have people in the courthouse that are going to help slow this down. And we don't, we, we don't have a pot to piss. We don't have the money to build this thing. So this is George's response. Okay, Sean. So you need to go talk to a local realtor and get a meeting with the HOA. You need to find out where that newest or nearest uh, sewage plant is. Talk to your attorney friend about getting funding. We'll see if they sell it, let me worry about the down payment. Donna, is Donna here? Donna, thank you for the down payment. <laughs> <laughs> she knows, she was in the car with us. Uh, his mind was made up over the course of the next year, he got the marina under contract for a million bucks, 20,000 down, one year closing date. He had plans drawn up to get the site at the right height, got the sewer plant two miles away to agree to allow him to run two plus miles of sewer lines to the property. <laughs> you guys know Troy, that's why you're laughing. <laughs> we met with the locals uh, at a local church to discuss the project, and Troy was basically the greatest show on earth. He did his Barnum and Bailey thing. Everybody loved him by the end. Um, and we went, met with the HOA to get their blessing. Now, the HOA at first only had one demand and said, hey, you guys are putting four-story condos up there. We don't have a ladder truck. We can't put fires out. We need to get us a fire truck. And Troy said, we'll do that when we close. We'll get you a good, used, certified fire truck. It'll be okay. We walked out and said, man, that's it. That's our last hurdle. Everything sounds great. This is over a year's time, guys. This is like 50 trips. Um, and Troy said, yeah, but those guys are going to want more concessions. He might not say that. So 
took something that was wild. <laughs> so, sure enough, he called me, he said the HOA president had called him and was basically shaking him down. Hey, we want a community center, we want a burn, he was listed all these things off. And uh, then he said, by the way, we're the HOA, we can make it difficult with zoning and code for you. Threat and try. I don't know how many of you guys know, but Troy didn't do well with threats. <laughs> so we <laughs> met <laughs> we met the uh, the HOA president at the marina and he started on his demands. And Troy stopped him and said, Look, I have an assignable contract. I can just sell this to somebody else, make a ton of money, which is true. I can sell this to somebody else, make a ton of money, and then these buyers, they're your problem. The guy said, Who are these buyers? And Troy says, Well, I've been approached by a Hell's Angels chapter. <laughs> <laughs> They want it as a clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> also been approached by a boat engine company out of Florida that wants to run tests on their racing engines. <laughs> <laughs> the, the house angels won't be intimidated, and the boat company has <clears throat> plenty of money in plenty of money in attorneys. The HOA president backed down, so now we're in the clear. We're almost near the end of the year. <laughs> the real estate. It took the real estate bubble popping and a recession to stop Troy on that deal. Mm -hmm. Now guys, you know when you're a kid and you first learn how to ride a bike and no one's told you about gravity? <laughs> you think you can ride that bike on a tightrope or on the top of a fence. But as we get older, someone tells you about gravity and they tell you what you want to do is impossible. We start to believe it. In fact, we stop dreaming because that little voice tells us it can't be done. And we believe the little voice. Troy talked about his friends, family, band members who were his friends and family. All the time, he loved and cared greatly about you. I want you to know that. But if you really want to honor him, start dreaming again. Live the life you want to live. Stop listening to the naysayers. And stop listening to that little voice. Troy taught me anything. There's something else I think Troy would want to say to that. Troy would want to say, I'm proud of you. Aww. I'm proud of your accomplishments. I'm proud of you as a person. And I'm proud to call you my friend. Thanks. Now, I don't know how you're going to follow these two. <laughs> Sorry, I need a little breath here. So my name is Howard. I'm one of Troy's oldest and best friends. How do I sum up 55 years of friendship? There's really not enough time. There really isn't. There's more chapters in this book than you could put in 10 movies. And I'm not kidding. He was the definition of the best friend. Our story's like a novel, okay? It starts with two small kids, his adventures would continue through a lifetime. <coughs> These adventures would come to shape who we are, the paths we took, and how we looked at life. When we, when we were together, things just happened. And that's really a theme of our story. <laughs> when Troy, shit happens. <laughs> I'm sure every person here can say the same thing. Okay? As children, we met around seven, playing in the neighborhood, riding bikes, playing tag, kick the can, wet the ball, fishing in green waters, if anybody's from New Jersey. Okay, that's somewhere you're not supposed to be. Okay, snakes, and all kinds. Anyway. Um, but we also rode horses. There was a a farmer had horses behind us, and we used to ride there back on, on these horses. So it, it was just an adventure all the time. No matter what we seemed to do, we always found the humor. And in Detroit, the worse things got, 
the funnier. Okay? So somehow we're we were playing tag in the cornfield, and somehow Troy convinced me to put corn down in the farmer's cannon that actually like scared crows away. He thought this was a great idea. Guess who didn't think it was a great idea? The farmer. <laughs> okay. Chased us numerous times. Somehow Troy's dad found out about it. And of course he was he was put down for weeks after that. Jeff was to tell you, his dad didn't play. <laughs> Uh, we did things like, uh, yeah, we played counties and Indians with BB guns. <laughs> okay? I have a scar under my eye. The Christmas story is real. Okay? <laughs> we also, you know, one afternoon, um, let's see here. We were always there for each other, with one exception. We always quick to give my dad a nickname, which I'm sure you guys heard him give everybody a name, time and time again. Okay, but my dad was named Archie Bunker. Okay? He didn't like anybody for any reason and was very verbal about it. Okay, but Troy was the only one who called him that one. He was a no nonsense guy. One, one day Troy came home, we rode, we rode bikes, we were out. Of course, I had a chores list. Like, we just got chores that you get home. He convinced me not to walk. <clears throat> so I rode up with Troy and a couple guys behind him on our bikes. We rode up. My dad's standing there. He's pushing the old mowers, you know, not the engine lines, the kind you had to push. Okay? Before I can get out of the sentence, Dad, I'll do that. I got backhanded across the car, down the other side. Where's my buddy Troy? Gone. <laughs> Time he can back me up. <laughs> so, uh, wrestling, we were teammates. You guys seen all the pictures, stuff like that. We we're teammates, and uh, we would starve ourselves, running for endless hours in the gym. <laughs> Troy used to wear a skin diving suit to lose weight. He would go from 140 to 115. Unbelievable, the dedication he had. Okay, I got injured uh, before senior year and couldn't continue. But Troy, I was there to help support Troy, and of course, you know, the coaches. He was tough, amazing, as we know, he was even on a scholarship to college on, on wrestling. But we also know Troy wasn't a school guy. <laughs> okay. I was there to help him through a lot of stuff, let's just say. But um, anyway, so that quickly ended. I went off to college, ran track, wrestled, that kind of stuff. But we always stayed in contact no matter what. We, we talked, if it wasn't every week, it was every other week, and then we talked two or three times. Music, of course, was the mainstay of his life, okay? It started very young. Came from a family of musicians. He played guitar. I was the drummer. <laughs> we practiced in my house because it was easy for him to carry a guitar. My parents didn't mind the noise. Okay, um, Troy's dad. They didn't like the kind of music we played. <laughs> it was loud. Let's just say. Although my mother would often say, "When are you guys going to learn more than one song?" <laughs> Smoke on the water was driving her crazy for six months. I tell you. Okay. My basement often flooded. So, what did we do? We put locks across the water to still play music, and then we had to plug in his guitar. Okay? Now, we used to play rock, paper, scissors to see who won and lost. Um, my family knows how good I am at rock, paper, scissors now, <laughs> and the reason why. Because Troy often lost and got knocked on his ass more than once. <laughs> As life went on, um, we had a band in high school called the Trojans, believe it or not. <laughs> that was a memory that will never, ever lose anybody that ever attended our school. Okay? We created, Troy wrote a song called Hot Nuts about the teachers. <laughs> I often thought that was, if we're all going to be expelled, that's the end of my career. But Troy's personality came through. Nothing ever happened. They laughed it off, which was great. Of course, he pursued, pursued it his music, many bands, many songs recorded. He became one of the greatest guitar players I've ever seen. I'd come and sit, listen to him play, and of course, sit in on him once in a while. He'd allow me to sit in on the bands and play. Something I'll cherish the rest of my life. I'm glad he enjoyed his music. And right up to the very end, of course, as we know. 
You may be familiar with a, with a product that you invented called the Pool Rider. <laughs> <laughs> when Troy and I grew up, his dad, you know, young Troy was growing up, his dad always wanted to experience what we did, which was put baseball cards in his post on a bike. Well, this sprung an idea, of course, that just Troy, when he grabbed on to something, he grabbed on like never to lick out. So we worked together for years on this idea. Caitlin, God bless her, put up the agony of the noise in her garage with the electric motor going 24 hours a day, right? I mean, like, insanity. But God bless her, she did it. I was a big picture guy, you know, trying to get things done, the money guy, and he was the engineer. I mean, he had this thing, again, when he looked at something, he kept perfecting, perfecting, perfecting. It's not loud enough. It, I mean, like, that's, it was like a ladder of break windows. But, you know, he was so passionate about everything that he did, especially this. I got him a pool rider van. We went around shows, everything, just to pr produce his things up. We had meetings with the NFL. Um, you know, it, it was really one of these things that, that he had so much passion about. Um, up and Really, up until now, we always thought this would be the million dollar idea that would finally work. Troy's working on some idea always to revolutionize something he always had, obviously, the biggest dreams and the biggest dreamer I've ever known in my life, of course. I was always there to support him and always believe in him and any, everything he did. I think I was his biggest fan, besides me. <laughs> real estate. What you might not know is when Troy started real estate. We were in New Jersey, decided to get into real estate. We didn't know anything about real estate, okay? <laughs> but he wanted to be the expert. <clears throat> Went after share sales. We read a book, that's what you do. We would go to auctions, try to buy something, we'd scout our properties on the list. The first house was a burnout house that we didn't see from an auction that they were doing voodoo sacrifices in. <laughs> <laughs> that was the craziest thing ever, right? Remnants of homes and stuff in the fireplace, it was crazy. <laughs> the next house we went to was a foreclosure lady. We got it, Troy, of course, sweet talk to her in, right? Oh yeah, come in, come in, come in. Within three minutes, she was sicking her two large Doberman pinchers on us. And it was like a Three Stooges movie. Who was trying to get out the door first? <laughs> Fighting each other just to get out. Then came Billy from South Philly. Do you remember Billy? <laughs> He's a mob guy. They wrote books and a movie on him. <laughs> Troy gets him to finance a deal. <laughs> How and when he ran into this guy, I, I blanked it out, I believe. So Troy calls me up one day and says, Listen, I gotta collect some money, I uh, got an investor, I think we're out of here. So we go into, into South Philly, okay? And if you guys are not from the city, these are people you just don't want to mess with too much. But Troy did. He was never afraid of anything, of course, as we know. So we met him in a garage. Uh, Troy introduced me, we grabbed the money, the guy showed us around, no big deal. He was showing off his rare Corvette in the corner. Didn't think anything of it. Later that night, Galen and Troy went to dinner with this guy. <laughs> he pulls Troy aside and says, hey Troy, um, who's that guy you're with? How well do you know him? <laughs> Troy goes, he's like my brother, what do you mean? He said, my car's gone. <laughs> Okay, my car's gone, and I'm sending some guys out to look for your friend. Oh my God. <laughs> so, for the next 24 hours, Troy runs to the bathroom, calls me, said, Don't go home. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go home. So, for the next 24 hours, I'm ghost. <laughs> I'm, I'm everywhere but home. He calls me the next day and says, Oh, you're off the hook. His brother moved the car. <laughs> He said, you're lucky you found it because you might not be here. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff Troy not got into. <laughs> so obviously Troy was, was great with what he, what he did with real estate and, and became a professional on it. Real estate was his knack. I kind of always guided him back to real estate no matter what he did. He could charm, charm the pants off anybody. Obviously in, instantly likable and he was un unbelievable. <clears throat> The monkey zoo. 
<laughs> Most of you, I would assume you might have heard a tidbit of this story, of the monkeys. So, Troy and I are down in the Tampa area looking at a, a defunct townhouse development. Okay? He hears about this monkey zoo. He says, come on, we're going to take a ride. We're going to see this. It's, it's amazing. We're going to go. We're going to go. Wait. All right, let's go. Of course, why not? That's what we do. As we go into big science, it says, don't pet the animals. Loss of limb. Okay? There's a sign as you walk in. We meet the guy, the caretaker. He's got fingers like this. <laughs> oh, you know, the monkeys are the most powerful animals ever. So, don't mess with them. So the story starts with the cages stacked on each other with monkeys, and they would walk over, and one would go, and the other monkey would go over, and then he would reach his arm out and slap the other monkey in the face. <laughs> well, Troy thought this was the most funniest thing in the world. He was throwing peanuts at him to make him do it again and do it again. So, it just went crazy. Go to the orangutan, orangutan cage. Science says throws down. I don't know if you understand what that means, but it's not good. <laughs> There's a guy with his child next to us, and he's making fun. He says of this, this orangutan. And we're laughing, Troy and I, and all of a sudden, the monkey reaches around. Whack! He throws it. Hits the guy, of course, it splatters on me because I'm near the guy. <laughs> so for the next 30 years, Troy tells the story of the orangutan throwing crap at me <laughs> as the funniest thing you've ever seen in his life. So meanwhile, he's laying on the ground, laughing his ass off. <laughs> what he doesn't tell you is that there was an alligator oh. area where you feed the alligators right there, too. I get cleaned up, we go, there's an alligator there, and you can feed the alligators. It will allow you to take the chicken and throw it in there. So Troy decides, yeah, I'll do that, so I'm, I'm game for this. So what happens? He takes the chicken, and as soon as he starts to lean, I grab his pants and pull him down. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know whether to drop the chicken, pull his pants up, and he'd have peeing himself at the same time. <laughs> That's the end of the story you didn't hear. All right? So now everybody knows the truth. <laughs> cars was, was his life. We grew up in, being in the car business. His dad owned a dealership. My uncle was a car dealership. We had mirrored lives in a lot of ways. So many stories about cars, I can't even tell you. But he quickly learned how to work on cars. He specialized in Porsches. He would meet these football players, and famous people. And so he was looking, obviously, I was right alongside of him. All right, we get a car, I can get the money, you do the work, we split the profit, we're really doing deals. So it was phenomenal. But we need some parts. So he finds this guy in North Philadelphia, <laughs> selling parts, okay? We roll in into this warehouse, what do we see? Guns all over the table. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, not again. <laughs> so, obviously, Troy, this being Troy, sweet talks to these guys, had them laughing so hard, they loved us, they gave us the car with no money, but we had $24 to pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we took the car, obviously we ran back and paid them. Troy had mentioned how good of a driver I was, and that he could, I could drive the wheels off anything. And, you know, that was one of my talents. But they offered us $10,000 to drive the car back from Miami. No. As long as we didn't look in the trunk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say that we declined on that, though. So, nothing to worry about there, buddy. <laughs> but that's the trouble and the kind of things that shit happened with Troy. <laughs> it just happened. I was fortunate enough that, as a driver, you get a Budweiser sponsored race in Charles. Troy and Troy Jr. came. 24 professional race, race car drivers, NASCAR, mostly Kevin Harvick, uh, Ryan Truex, Mike Barnett. I 
took 11. Jerry says, yeah, I'm proud of you. What the, why did, why did you win? <laughs> like, really, really, why didn't I win? But that's, that's who he is. You should have took a few of them out. Don't they know who you are? That was his statement. <laughs> that's Troy, always making you laugh, no matter what, what went on. Oh, we got a few more minutes. Hang in there. <laughs> Sirius is a heart attack. Always used to say that. That was his go-to when, when he meant something serious. Serious is a heart attack. Heart attack number one. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Troy did have a heart attack a long time ago. Called me up after he was rushed to the hospital, had the learning clears blockage, only say, yeah, I was laying on the floor asking for the tongues. What a dumbass I was. <laughs> Even Kay Lynn once stepped over me to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> You know, maybe I, I was joking around and I'm laying on the floor, I couldn't get up. <coughs> so, uh, of course, I quickly went to his side, laughed his way home again, only determined it was, it was time to distress. Of course, moved to, to Caroline's and, and started a life with his family. Um, who would have known 20 years later or so that this would be happening? Miniature sh struggled with his diet, I constantly say how I was concerned all the time for him. Just wanted to be healthy and happy. He wanted to enjoy food though. It was his life. He loved it. Come to Philly in the middle of time. Build a Roma. Build a Roma. I gotta go build a Roma. That's, that's my place. And he would just eat and eat and just love it. <laughs> he lived his terms on, or he lived his life on his own terms, no matter what. He really did. Um, some of you know that I've had a, a few bouts with cancer. When I was going through my bout with kidney cancer, Troy came in and said, listen, if you find out you're not going to make it, we'll go to the bridge, we'll jump off together. <laughs> so he told me, and he meant it. He was serious as a heart attack. <laughs> he said, I don't want to lose you, brother. You have to fight this thing no matter what. You are my brother, and I can't imagine life without you. I can't imagine life without you. All I can do is count how lucky to have such a good friend for 55 years. Lucky to have shared my childhood, my youth, my adult life, and be part of his story, his family, and part of my family. I pray to see you again, laugh, and laugh until we cry. The tears of joy, my friend, will live in my heart forever. I got a story that, that kind of will relate, a little poem, it's quick. It's called The Dash of Time. I'm a man who stands just here in front of you to speak for a friend. I refer to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. First, you notice the date of birth. Next, I will talk to the following date with tears. I say to you what matters most of all is the dash between the years. For the dash represents all the time you spent here on earth and how only those who live, live them know what the line is actually worth. So it matters not what we own, the cars, the houses, the cash. It matters most of how we live and love and how we spent the dash. So think about it long and hard, and if there's things you'd like to change, for you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick with anger, show appreciation more. Love the people in our lives like we never lived, loved before. If we treat each other with respect and often wear a smile, remember the dash might only last a while. At the end, people don't often regret what they did, much more of what they didn't do. So what's on your list, I say to you? So in your eulogy, to be read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about you and how you lived your dash? Although my friend is gone, this dash will continue to live on with us. Thank you.
of you and the congregation the opportunity to share some words. Uh, if you want to come up here, you may, but if you don't want to come here, you can just stand and, and just share briefly some, some words. As you see, you don't have to be sad, uh, but in, from the heart, just whatever you want to say. So anybody who likes it, to share with us some more words. Richard, uh, for Cole Melmore, long story behind that, don't go through that. <laughs> um, not as polished a speaker as these gentlemen who spoke already, but uh, I just felt that really want me was for Troy. Uh, a, right after Troy moved to Charlotte, uh, uh, he had uh, he started playing music, wanted to play more music, and uh, I answered, the, I'm a home bass player, I answered an ad that he put in the paper uh, to, uh, for a, a blues band. I've never, I've never auditioned before in my life. I've played with all those people I knew, but I'll try this. He says, uh, I asked for the mouse. So I uh, dropped the Matthews, and this is Gabe, and two kids were there, they were very young, and, uh, and I said, but I asked him, what, what songs do you want me to learn? He says, just show up. Uh, uh, he says, I'll know. Okay. <laughs> So, so he starts drilling me on stuff we're playing, and he goes, uh, and at one point we're playing something, and he just says, stop. He goes, and he did go, do 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 do. I said, well, what did I do? He says, you did do 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 do. I said, <laughs> so one more time? He said, what is it? I play it, and he says, no, no, do 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 do. Well, you gotta listen. So I played the exact same thing I did before. He says, that's it. <laughs> and then, at the end of it, I said, so when do you think, uh, well, you know, maybe know something, you finish the audition, she says, you'll do. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, you'll do. And I had no way of knowing that that would be, you know, he'd become one of my closest friends <laughs> after that experience. So, so uh, fast forward a couple of years, we've been playing in bands, I get married. And by the time we paid for the wedding and the honeymoon stuff that, and the reception that my wife wanted, we didn't have enough money left for the limo and, and the chauffeur that we needed to drive us from the, the, the reception was about 20 minutes away, sorry, about 20 minutes away. And, and she said, I'll just get a nice car off Troy Dallas. Uh, Having Troy as the chauffeur that I <laughs> I can't repeat any of the things he said, but he made inappropriate suggestions, jokes, <laughs> the whole way. <laughs> and a story that, you know, Troy was hilarious, that he loved to, he would say bust balls, for lack of a better word, that's what he loved, loved to give you a hard time. He was also very kind and loving. And he, he loved people, he loved animals, and something I think shows this. One time uh, he was late for band practice, and he says, yeah, I got pulled over. He said, actually, I was driving out of this road, and there was a turtle. <laughs> and Troy loved animals, so he had to stop and get the turtle out of the road. And he ran it into the woods, dropped it off. By the time he got back to his car, there was a policeman waiting <laughs> Policeman says, you can't stop here just to go take a leak. I'm giving you a ticket for where that's. He says, no, I didn't. I, I, no, really. I took a turtle into the woods. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're getting a ticket unless you can show me the turtle. <laughs> Troy runs back into the woods. He can't find the turtle. <laughs> he finally finds it. And he said, the look on that policeman's face. <laughs> and he came running out with a girl. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. He was late. No big deal. Uh, but uh, I'll just finish with this. Troy, his, the most amazing thing to me about Troy that really inspired me was his love of family and the way his family loved him. When we were playing together, this is back 20 years ago, and his kids were teenagers, we would go to uh, play gigs up at Lake Norman where a lot of kids that age, you know, 15, 13 to 15, they don't want to hang out with their parents. These kids didn't go because they were forced to. 
they liked being there, and they had fun, and it, and it was like, that is so cool. And um, this was probably 10 years ago, I was talking to Troy one day, and I don't know how we got on this subject, but you know, if you figure 10 years ago, he and Gabe have been together, I don't know how long, I think we were in their 20s. Let, 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 let's be honest, a lot of couples don't make it that long, and the ones that do, sometimes put up with each other. But Troy, he was talking to me, and he just kept talking to me about how he met Galen, and the awe in his eyes, he kept talking about Galen James, prettiest girl from the next town over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he must have said that phrase 10 times. Like he just couldn't believe it. he got Galen James, prettiest girl from the next town over. <laughs> and and when you hear him talk about Galen, what is family? Like, that's the awe he had for them and the love. And uh, that's why I'm so proud to call them. Say, 
shake their hand like you got a bear. Which is, I have tried to do my entire life. One guy, one guy we met, and we did a real estate deal with at Matthews a couple years ago. This guy was some big redneck from West Virginia. Came down and he shook our hands both. And I think we both about cried. This guy was the only guy that ever shook our hands and, you know, he crushed our hands. Um, you know, he, uh, he taught me always to hold the door for women growing up, you know, and elderly people. Respect your elders and respect girls. So, this first story I'm going to tell is uh, my sister probably. I don't know if she remembers this or not, but uh, we were young. I was probably seven. She was five. And uh, as any older brother does, he kind of gets annoyed with his little sister, always tagging along. <laughs> My, ha my dad happened to be home this day, and for some, some you know, my bad luck, he saw me <laughs> smack in the back of the head. <laughs> he says, oh, come here. He goes, you poke you in the chest, that chest yeah. poke too. Right in the chest, that hard poke. He says, you don't ever poke a woman, or, uh, or hit a woman, ever, ever. He said, especially not your sister. <laughs> he says, I'm going to teach you a lesson. He says, get down on your knees. So I was taller than Jesse, you know, two years older than her. So I got down on my knees, and he held my hands behind my back. And he said, Jesse, punch him right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so she went, to, she, went to, she went to hit me, and, you know, just, she, was, she didn't know what's going on. And she went, and she just kind of went like that, and just kind of missed great the top of my head. He goes, uh-uh. <laughs> Do it again. Put some power into it. And she hit me in square in the nose. It felt like Mike Tyson hit me. I was crying, screaming. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot that day. And, uh, I always remember him doing that. <laughs> holding my arms back and holding me down. He always had me uh, with him, you know, as, as, a, as a young as a young kid. Uh, whether it's collecting rent at uh, Spencer Island, in the Pens Grove, you know, <laughs> which was uh, comical within itself. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, working on a house in the body shop, or even just to stop by my grandfather's uh, Buick dealership. Um, you know, I didn't realize it then, just being a kid, but uh, looking back. Even just being present with him in family business situations helped me understand understand a lot, you know, later on in life. Um, as I got older, we lived in uh, we moved to Woodstown, New Jersey. Um, that's kind of where I spent the bulk of our late elementary school, middle school years. And as any older kid does, I started being a little bit of a smart ass. <laughs> So the next story is where I learned how to be humble. <laughs> I said something to him. <laughs> and he says, what the hell did you just say? And I said something smart ass back to him. You heard me or something like that. He said, that's it. He said, come up with me right now. He says, you're packing your bags right now. He goes, you're going to go live with Leticia down in Spencer, in Pensburg over Spencer Island. And he literally, this lady was a hard lady. A single mom, a single mom of like four kids, you know, just, he had HUD houses. He loved his tenants, they loved him. But they just, you know, they needed help. And, uh, but they were hard people, they lived, they lived hard. And he said to her, he said, treat him exactly how you treat your own kids. Smack his ass upside the head. Do whatever you gotta do. Straighten him out. He says he's over here in Woodstown thinking he's a little rich kid, smart ass, you know? Something like that. That was that was uh that was quite the experience. Uh, once, we, once we came down here, um, throughout middle school and high school, um, I started to get really into sports, more specifically wrestling. Um, it was a given, as I'm sure you can all you all know, uh, his past wrestling accomplishments and all that. That he would absolutely have to coach me throughout all these years, which he did. He coached me from first grade all the way up until you know I graduated high school. And uh, 
Uh, we've got a couple of us here that he also coached in this room. Um, I learned a lot from him as a coach, not just my father, but I had to look at him as a coach, not just my father. And he didn't cut any slack for me, that's for sure. I was probably, it was probably harder on me. Um, I learned not to be a sore loser, not to give up ever, which, I mean, he never gave up in anything in life. Um, and if you say you're going to commit to something, you need to commit to it and finish it. Um, you know, about probably halfway through my junior year season, I said, I had enough of this. I just had enough. I'm tired of cutting weight. I'm tired of just having no time. I'm tired of all of it. He said, you know what? He goes, I never asked you to wrestle. He says, you did that on your own. He says, you can stop wrestling. He says, but you're not going to quit in the middle of the season. He goes, and let everybody down that you committed to on this team. So that right there was a lesson right there. I never, I never did quit. Um, <laughs> he was a tough coach. <laughs> and I think I uh, have kind of rolled that over. Rick Stack here, uh, we coached together. We, we tough guys, took it from him too. Um, throughout high school, uh, he also taught me the lesson to how, how to earn a dollar the hard way. <laughs> which is manual labor. <laughs> I spent countless hours sanding cars in the body shop. I painted a lot of cars for uh, his business partner at the time, Jim Burns. He actually made me paint those cars because uh, those were just kind of, yeah. It doesn't really matter who painted those cars, but I got to, I got to paint some cars. Um, I did all the grunt work in all the houses that he renovated, you know, cleaning up, you know, all that stuff in, in 29 degree weather outside, all that. I painted, I painted houses, I did flooring, all that stuff. Um, the funny thing is, is uh, I don't really remember getting paid for any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> but looking back, that's okay, because I got him back when I decided to go to college. <laughs> he, was actually, he was actually thrilled that uh, he had to come up with the money for that. I actually just, I, was, I applied late, so I just showed up one day, hey man, I'm going to college in like two weeks. And he was like, he was like, what the hell? So I was like, it's like 20 grand. <laughs> and he was like, student loans? I was like, nah, it's no student loan. I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that student loan stuff. So, um, <laughs> you know, time, around that time, uh, things were, were kind of tight. Money-wise for our family, you know how it is when you're doing business for yourself. It's up and down and up and down. Well, this happened to be one of the down times. Um, he was waiting on uh, his first payment from his very first flip he did here in North Carolina. When she was getting out of the body shop business. And I remember he was struggling trying to make money in the body shop business. And uh, he didn't want to go back to real estate because he had a heart attack. And we moved down here and all that stuff. And, and my mom, you know you know, struggling to keep the, the light bill on sometimes when you work in the body shop. My mom says, uh, you better go do a real estate deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, time to, it's time to get back into real estate. <laughs> so, so he did, but at the time, he, was, he hadn't gotten paid for the first deal yet, and he wasn't going to get paid until after Christmas. So um, I was riding around with him on Christmas Eve, uh, whatever year that was, and he literally only had $150 to his name in his wallet. We went to Hardy's in Indian Trail. We ordered food for the four of us, you know, me, my mom, him, and my sister. And he had a hundred, I saw, I was sitting right there watching him the whole time. And he had a hundred dollar bill and a fifty dollar bill in his wallet. And he took out the hundred dollar bill and gave it to the girl at the window. And she was counting the change out. And she went to hand it back to him. And he said, looked at her and said, keep the change, have a Merry Christmas, and he took off. And her jaw dropped to the floor. It was something to see. I said, Are you, what is going on here, man? And he said, you know what? He said, this girl's working at parties on Christmas Eve. He goes, she needs that a lot more than we do. I'll make it back. So I always remember him saying, I've told that story to a couple people probably in this room, but I'm always going to remember him 
doing that. It just shows the kind of heart he had. He gave most of his money that he had in his possession at that point. On Christmas Eve, to some girl he didn't even know, so it really struck me, you know, as, as a young man. Um, I'm always going to love that. Um, so we get to the college years. Uh, of course, I would always hit him up for money. I told him I needed money for books. Uh, it wasn't books. <laughs> it was beer. <laughs> he didn't know all that until many years later after college. <laughs> wasn't thrilled. Um, during college, he decided to have me work for him doing, uh, doing title work at, at the courthouses on different real estate deals. And uh, um, that taught me then, first of all, that was the first step of, of how to do real estate, but it also taught me then without saying it. That organization is the key to success. Um, towards the end of college, I actually did my first real estate deal with him. Um, after college, I didn't really want to go that, that route. Um, I went to work for a company out of Germany at the Charlotte branch for two years. <laughs> Thought I had it all figured out. And then this is when uh, Sean and him were doing the Lake Water deal. I was working at this, at this, uh, this company and the recession hit. And then poof, I had no job. <laughs> uh, after that, I said, well, I'm going to try playing music for a while, and uh, I did. Me and my buddies back there, we played music for two years. I played with them. I played with him a lot. He played with us. You know, it was, it was good times. Uh, I got tired of that lifestyle quick, and uh, not quick. It took two years, but uh, he finally said to me, he says, what the hell are you doing, man? He goes, are you tired of space? He says, are you not just like just ready to stop screwing around and make some real money now? I said, yes, for the love of God, please. <laughs> and that conversation there I had with him was where the last 11 years or 12 years started just from that conversation. Um, you know, we worked every day together since that conversation. Uh, he said, at the beginning of this, he said, nothing will be given to me, which I didn't expect that. Uh, he said, I have to work for everything. And he sure didn't make me work for it. <laughs> I pretty much did most of everything. <laughs> Besides close the deal. <laughs> and I think I was making like 5 to 10% per deal. <laughs> but I was happy with it. It was cool. Um, I learned the ins and outs from him for the entire business. Um, <laughs> somebody's driving. Um, <laughs> I also learned how to deal with people in distressed situations and keep cool in distressed situations, which when you're going to talk to somebody in a foreclosure situation, it's one of the worst times of their life. Their whole life is imploding in on them. And needless to say, they're a little agitated, to say the least. And the way we do the deal is we don't just go buy them the deals. We go knock on the door and physically talk to the person that's getting foreclosed on. So it's a, quite the treasure hunt, I guess you could say. Um, you know, I, I got to say that between me and him, with me and him, we, we, we were pretty successful. Uh, pretty much closed, you know, nine out of ten deals. You know, I mean, we would. It was just, I don't know, something worked. The father-son thing, maybe, uh, maybe it was the gym shorts and the t-shirts that we normally wear. That's our normal business attire. You know, and people think we're just the neighbor from next door or something. But um, somehow we got these deals. But there's this one deal we did not get. And this woman, we knocked on her door. And she busts through the door and starts screaming, you mother effer this and that. And this is in his face, this close, spit flying out of her mouth. I'm like, what is going on here? So after all that, after she finally just stopped berating him for like five minutes, just screaming in his face, I thought the lady was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> kind of paused there. He goes, so you're saying you don't want to sell us your house? <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me <laughs> like I had three heads. She goes, is he defective or something? <laughs> The Uncle Jeff term. I said it's not a defect, it's a characteristic. Of him. <laughs> she said, Get the hell out of here for cold cops. So we quickly left. <laughs> um, throughout all this business, uh, throughout all, I had 
so many, so many stories just every day, every, every day. Just, I laughed every single day. I can honestly say I laughed so hard every day. Not just ha-ha, really laughed. This guy was hilarious. Um, throughout all the business stuff, I was around him every single day, all day, like I said. Um, Sean was talking about uh, the Flip This House up pilot that was recorded. Well, I just happened to see that the other day. And <laughs> in true Troy Spencer flash fashion, he closed the pilot episode. I think this was around 2001 ish, maybe. Um, but he closed it by saying, I'm Troy Spencer for Flip This House. <laughs> and where else but in America can you take a piece of shit like this and make $30,000? <laughs> Doing everything you can with that person. 
Um, in closing, I'm going to miss this man. My dad, if anyone here realizes, I'm actually devastated with this. At the same time, I'm extremely blessed to have been able to have 37 years with him. Not a lot of people can say that about their fathers. I'm glad I got to have 37 with him. I get to learn so much from him, and I'm going to continue with the vision and legacy that over the past 11, 12 years we have set together. Um, the last conversation I actually had with him, uh, you know, he said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make, make it out of this one. And uh, he said, no matter what happens, do not stop, go full steam ahead, and, and, and handle everything we talked about over, over these past couple of years, which we will. Um, he was not only my dad, he was my business partner for many years. I've never had another one. Um, thankfully, uh, in, our, in our new business ventures, we have uh, two great guys on the team that are really helping me through this, uh, Lewis and Phil. Really, I mean, I don't know what I'd do without you guys. You know, it was just me. I mean, God knows. I appreciate you guys so much. Um, he was my bandmate, you know, as loud as he was, like we said. <laughs> uh, and he was my best friend. I'm going to miss him, but I know he's with us. I know that for a fact. Uh, I'm even, I was talking about this with Heather the other day. I said, I'm even going to miss some of the crazy things that he would do that would drive me absolutely nuts. <laughs> the stuff you kind of take for granted. You know, the 8 or 9 a.m. calls every morning <laughs> to discuss the day's plans. Troy's, what are we doing today? You know, stuff like that. And then after work with him all day, the 11 or 12 o'clock at night calls to discuss what we already did during that day. <laughs> every day. And it's all good. I'm really going to miss those, you know, at the time. And, you know, like, what the hell? But, uh, but now it's the man. I was so glad I have a couple of voicemails from him actually kind of breaking my stones about not answering the phone. <laughs> uh, and even the lick, guitar, you know, lick, guitar lick, after guitar lick, after 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 lick, next to me in the office. <laughs> While I'm trying to do stuff for work. You know, eventually you just, you just let, him, let him roll with it. At the beginning it was a little tougher. <laughs> and I think Lewis, Lewis said the same thing. He said, hey, play the same thing over and over and over. <laughs> I am going to miss that, though. I really am. Um, I know he's up there playing right now with his friends Bo on drums, Tub on bass, Robin singing, Robin Rogers, and him on guitar. And that right there is one hell of a band. And until we meet again. Uh, I am now going to do my best to attempt to read a letter from my mother. I read it 800 times already today, so I wouldn't have <laughs> so I could go through it. Okay, she says, this is from my mom, Gaylene, she says, we met in a bar. You asked me to slow dance, and I kicked my shoes off and we slow danced. Little did we know that we would spend the next 40 plus years doing this thing called life. Who can live your life with someone that loves you unconditionally and puts you first always? And that is a 100% fact, always. That was my life with you. God put you in my life and in my heart for a reason. You made me laugh every single day even through the hard times, you were the better half of us. So is it an ironic that we're celebrating your life in a bar? I know when I see you again, you'll be waiting for me, and you'll ask me to slow dance. I'll then kick off my shoes, and we'll slow dance forever. I love you, Troy. After this, we ask that uh, if you guys feel like it, you can uh, come visit with us at a, a little place that uh, he's, he's been playing at quite a bit the past couple months uh, called Whiskey Beach in Myrtle Beach. Uh, we'll have food there and, and uh, keep going with the stories. 
probably a lot that we can't tell up here. <laughs> so, uh, thank you guys again for everything, and uh, we, we appreciate you all. change folks' frowns to smiles again, then I will not have lived in vain. And I'll not care how long I live if I can give and give and give. And God let him do that for 62 years. And I'm sure that uh, Galen knows about the, the years that God gave them together, 40 years, two months from now, be 41 in May. But we've heard beautiful expressions like a life well lived. I think somebody said that uh, hilarity is a true mark of Christianity. <laughs> That's true. So many people think if you're a Christian, you've got to go along with a dull face, never smiling. That's a perversion of what Jesus came to bring to us. He came to bring us to find that's what Carl Troy did in so many ways. And I think that uh, the song that Kevin's going to come and sing now is sort of reflective of that. Uh, we'll close the service. I'll have a prayer after he sings, but uh, he's going to come and sing. You raise me up. There he comes. <coughs>
when troubles come and my heart burden be, then I
ourselves and our prayer in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus, that name for which we do have victory even over death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 